Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juan Gaitan, Selnex Director of Investor Relations, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today for our Q2 2023 Results Conference Call. In this occasion, I'm joined by our CEO, Marco Patuano, and our CEO, Jose Manuel Aiza, who will lead today's session. We will now share the main highlights of the period, how we are progressing on the targets of the next chapter of our equity story, and then we will open the line for your questions. As a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star five in your keyboard. And without further ado, over to you, Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Juan, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. As you know, this is my first earning call as a CEO of Selnex. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, in reality, I'm a bit old of this industry, so I know many of you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for having me back. I look forward to interact with you, meeting you, building uh, the usual strong relation during what I believe it's going to be a very exciting journey here in, in Salnex. So let me start uh, by reiterating uh, the strategic priorities uh, that Salnex uh, uh, made very clear in stating its next chapter, chapter which uh, are not going to change under my mandate because of the board unconditional commitment to them but even more importantly, because I truly believe that this is the path we must follow in the current environment in order to continue to create value. Just as a reminder, uh, we are confirming all our short and medium term financial targets. We will aim our efforts at reducing our debt uh, with the intention to become investment grade uh, by uh, Standard & Poor's by the end of 2024 at the latest. We will continue focusing on the maximization of cash flow through organic growth and efficiencies, and we will carry on with the ongoing assessment of strategic options uh, for our portfolio of assets in order to crystallize the value and secure the path to investment grade. The moment we will reach this status and we will start generating cash flow above our CapEx commitments when we become free cash flow positive, to be clear, we will balance the allocation of the capital between organic growth projects subject to the usual strict return criteria and a new distribution policy in order to maximize the value for our shareholders. So let's now focus on the business performance of this quarter. We are once again providing solid numbers showing that the whole organization is aligned and fully committed to the execution of our strategy. So first of all, the period has been marked by an excellent commercial performance consistent operational execution, POPs increasing 7.1% compared to the last year, revenues excluding pass-through increasing 17%, adjusted the BDA in the recurring lever, lever free cash flow at 16% growth, or free cash flow reaching minus 130 million, which is more than 600 million increase, and it is expected to break even by the end of this year. In half one, we have also closed the first tranche of site remedies in France. And on the second tranche, we are progressing well and we are on track. We are also announcing two new organic growth projects with Anchor clients in France. First one is with SFR, and it consists in an investment of around 275 million over a period of six years for the construction of new site and much more importantly, for the co-location of new POPs on existing sites. The organic growth to be created in this context will generate more anchor tenant revenues. The second project consists in an extension of our fiber to the tower agreement with Buick Telecom. The project scope has been increased with an additional 275 million euro investment over six years for incremental EBDA upon the completion of the works. We are therefore strengthening our relationship with our Arthur clients in France and meeting our clients' increased connectivity needs at a very attractive valuation without impacting our delivering targets due to the staggered profile of these investments. Finally, we are also announcing our intention to organize a Capital Market Day in early 2024. In this occasion, we will provide you an update on our industrial proposition. And I mean, uh, we will see uh, how do we see the collocation going forward, the prospects for more BTS, the tower adjacent asset opportunity, and uh, what else we can do from uh, the lease management perspective. We will do a deep focus on value drivers. 
the different building blocks of our organic growth and how they contribute to our financial. We will set up a new efficiency plan after the deep dive analysis that we are undertaking, and there will be an updated financial outlook. Uh, last, an update of our financial strategy, balance sheet management, capital allocation priorities and criteria, shareholder remuneration policy that I'm sure you're always all interested in. Now, uh, Jose Manuel Laiza, our CFO, will provide you more details on the period. So, Jose Manuel, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marco. Since you already have the full presentation, I will just provide a few additional remarks on the period our capital allocation priorities, and our financial strategy. The quarter has seen again an excellent commercial performance, with organic PUPs growing at 7.1% compared to the same period last year. This is mainly due to the progress made on our build to suit programs in France, Poland, the UK, and Italy, with 3% growth attributable to BTS, and the POP is generated mainly in Portugal and Italy, with the rest of our markets also showing a steady performance. POP growth linked to new collocations has reached a very strong 4.1% this period. Excluding the impact from pass-throughs, revenues have increased 17% compared to the same period last year. EBTA 16% and recurrent layer free cash flow 16%. Please bear in mind that this performance corresponds to H1, and when looking at Q2 only, our EBTA has grown faster than our revenues compared to Q2 last year. In this context, just a, week, uh, just a quick comment on the deep dive analysis that Thermes is currently undertaking of its cost structure and the conclusions we will be presenting our upcoming Capital Markets Day. Now, moving to our free cash flow, defined as recurrent level free cash flow minus expansion capes minus to sub capes plus cash received from remedies, it has reached minus 130 million euros, more than 600 million euros increase compared to the same period last year. This is an important improvement, and it is expected to break, to get break even by the end of this year. Going forward, our free cash flow generation will further accelerate as we reach the end of our b 2 programs. And this will underpin our rapid delivery and will give us the financial flexibility to continue growing organically with our clients and to establish an attractive shareholder remuneration policy. In terms of balance sheet management, Thernes is constantly monitoring market conditions and assessing the benefits of different debt instruments in order to achieve an optimal capital structure and choose the most appropriate option to tackle near-term refinancing needs. As such, we are actively working to push debt maturities forward, considering a number of options which we hope we can present to you very soon. As Marco has already mentioned, we have made the unconditional commitment to maintain adjusted level consistently below seven times VTA, with the objective to become investment grade by S&P, as well as to maintain our investment grade status by Fitch. This commitment and its subsequent delivery should allow Thelness to access a deeper debt market at complete terms. While we are assessing strategic options for our portfolio of assets to continue crystallizing value and secure this deleveraging process. And with this, we remain now at your disposal to answer you any questions. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Jose Manuel. First question comes from Andrew Lee from Goldman Sachs. Please, Andrew, go, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the questions. And, um, the results themselves are pretty straightforward and you know, a great expansion of co-tenancy growth. So I, I just wanted to ask um, a few questions around uh, Outlook and I'm very wary that you may not be able to answer 
uh, some or all of them. So just going to put them out there and just see, see what you say. So just firstly, um, you, you highlighted cost optimization and efficiency plan. I just wanted to clarify, um, you particularly for investors in U.S. towers that have noticed a gap in efficiency between U.S. telcos and European telcos, that that cost optimization uh, work that you're doing would be incremental to what you're doing already, i.e. the 90 to 100 million uh, savings plan. Um, so second question was on asset sales. Uh, there was some press speculation yesterday on um, Danish and Swedish asset sales and um, obviously not going to ask necessarily specifically about that, but one of the things it mentioned was um, a minority sale. I wondered if you could give us any early insights into your proclivity uh, for minority sales versus full asset sales. Uh, that would be really helpful. And then just finally, just a clarification. Um, I think, Marco, you mentioned uh, that you wouldn't consider shareholder returns um, before turning free cash flow positive. Um, is that correct? And if it is correct, what definition uh, do you mean on free cash flow there? Thank you. Yes. So the three questions, cost optimization. Uh, I'm, I think that... Uh, if you look at the any tower operator, cost structure is fairly straightforward, and uh, the largest uh, the largest cost driver is uh, on lease. So uh, there is no magic in order to make uh, to perform uh, a stronger uh, lease uh, efficiency. There is, there are two levels. Uh, one is renegotiation, and the other is uh, land aggregation. Uh, we're going to perform both. Mm, we are working on this. Uh, very actively working. We have some some uh, uh, new uh, possibilities that we are evaluating. So uh, for sure, this is one lever. The second lever, uh, we are working on uh, all the cost structure. Uh, we are making uh, our structure linear, especially at the at headquarter level. Uh, I know that uh, uh, cost of uh, uh, of uh, people is not uh, the the major driver of the optimization, but uh, it uh, drives. Uh, a, a lot of complexity, so we are we are going to to become leaner. Third, uh, we are going uh, we launched uh, a, a benchmarking internal benchmarking process, uh, so we are not uh, uh, always at the same level of efficiency all across our group, and we are going to work on this. Fourth, we have a very strong IT uh, program uh, in order to improve uh, our our plan. So there is a lot of things that we can do. Uh, if we compare ourselves with our with some of our peers, uh, not always we are the most uh, uh, efficient uh, of the group. So we have uh, to to understand how to become more more efficient. Asset sales. Well, uh, I don't want to speculate on uh, on rumors, but uh, let me say that uh, we. Uh, it, we like the idea of accelerating uh, the um, the investment grade uh, uh, and not uh, having it at the end of 2024, but having it before. So is it minority or is it full asset? Uh, uh, this quarter demonstrated that uh, being a pan-European group uh, uh, is a point of strength. Uh, we have a, a growth uh, uh, coming from BTS from some countries. We had growth coming from uh, Collocation from other countries, so I think that uh, trying to maintain a, a, a pan-European footprint uh, is uh, is important. Uh, now, two concepts. One, uh, if you look at our at our delivering uh, across uh, the the time uh, along the time, you will see that uh, uh, in coming years, uh, uh, inflows free cash flow inflows are going to be very robust. And so the possibility of uh, having some financial partners that have a day when they enter and a day when they exit can be a, a good opportunity. But if a country uh, is not going uh, or has not the possibility to reach the scale that make our operation efficient, uh, we will evaluate uh, eventually even a, a, a full asset sale uh, in case uh, there is not an industrial strategy that makes sense. So uh, we are we are let me say uh, driven by an industrial consideration. Uh, we want to perform. We want to stay pan-European, uh, but we need the scale in order to be to be pan-European. Uh, free cash flow. Maybe that I wasn't uh, I wasn't clear. Uh, I think that first we have to concentrate on being free cash flow positive. 
And once we are solid with free cash flow positive, we will evaluate all the possibilities in order to give a return uh, to the investors and to the shareholders uh, without excluding any alternative. Okay, so the next question comes from Akil Datani from JP Morgan. Please, Akil, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I've got a few, please. Um, firstly, Marco, um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, you're very much looking to support and endorse the strategy of the board, which obviously is good to see. Um, but I guess it would be interesting to understand, as you've had experience of Celnex um, as a chairman and obviously now as a CEO, um, how you think about routes to maybe enhance that strategy. I appreciate it's early days, but any sort of early thoughts you have in terms of where you see the greatest opportunities um, would be interesting. Um, second one is um, I was interested by the two new organic growth um, transactions that you've talked to today and you've announced. Um, and was keen to understand how those negotiations have gone. And I guess specifically what I'm trying to understand is, as we move into what is now clearly a higher rate environment, how has that altered the way the negotiations with counterparties work? And should we think about Cellnex now targeting higher IRRs than before to reflect your implicit high cost of capital? Um, and then the last one is just a very quick one, just on consolidation. Um, you've got a slide in your presentation talking about um, the way in which you think you're well defended against consolidation, but inevitably we always get a lot of questions about this from investors. Just as a very simple point, I wanted to understand if we think about Spanish and UK mergers that are currently pending, if both of these were to go through, can you talk us through what the near-term financial impact, if any, might be, assuming there are no remedies? So if we take the most extreme scenario where there's no remedies, what would be the maximum financial impact? Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting questions. So, so where are the greatest opportunities? Uh, uh, you know, if you look uh, at us across the group, uh, uh, we are a fairly diversified group uh, across uh, the uh, the different countries. Uh, in some countries, we are uh, a pure tower co. In some other countries, uh, we, ha we are a mixed tower co, where we make also fiber, and in other countries, we are half tip equipments like Poland. So the, the opportunity is, uh, there are two opportunities. One is uh, we have uh, to increase uh, uh, our use of the invested capital. And these uh, uh, give me also uh, the possibility to join in uh, your question number one and your question number two. So uh, we uh, have deployed a lot of capital and uh, a good part of, of our growth uh, was CapEx driven. Uh, going forward, uh, we will maintain uh, all our commitments. Uh, we still have uh, significant commitments that will give us uh, uh, tailwind uh, in the growth, uh, but we have to increase uh, the efficient use of our capital already invested. So this on the revenue side. Uh, so uh, we have uh, to, to work uh, on uh, uh, new revenue sources, uh, low capex intensity. Uh, the second uh, is, uh, 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 as uh, um, uh, our colleague of Goldman Sachs uh, asked before, uh, the cost optimization comes from uh, from lease. Uh, not in all the countries uh, we are uh, efficient uh, in lease, uh, so we can increase uh, uh, our uh, our performance. And we can increase uh, our uh, recurrent free cash flow. Uh, both uh, uh, investing uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, renegotiating. There are adjacent opportunities. Yes, there are adjacent opportunities. Uh, uh, in Poland, we are in the active uh, in the active equipment. I tell you the truth. We are conscious. We are calculative. Uh, we will not jump in the dark in this. Uh, we will make uh, aviation business, uh, especially if uh, require significant capex, uh, if the return on the invested capital is okay. So I don't consider, I don't consider 
uh, higher IRR because of the increase uh, of the of the interest rates only. Uh, we normally we don't take the short term interest rate as a reference. Uh, so we invest in infrastructure. We have to look at the long term uh, interest rates in order to set up our IRR. But it's clear that if we enter in more risky business, uh, we need to increase the expected IRR. Uh, and this is uh, uh, what uh, we, we are going to do. So we are going to be very prudent in this. Uh, you asked me about the negotiation level. How, why, what's the negotiation? This gives us a very good link between your first question and this question. Um, the agreement uh, uh, we signed with SFR is exactly, uh, and I underlined uh, that it's extremely important, possibility of having more point of presence in existing sites. So the possibility of increasing uh, our, our tenancy ratio goes also hand in hand with agreements and with negotiation that we can do with our partner. Uh, if you take France, uh, we have already uh, more than 25,000 sites. Uh, so when we discuss with our clients, first of all, we have to convince them that uh, they have or they can evaluate the possibility instead of building a new tower to, to uh, use an existing one, which can be cheaper for them and it can be value creative for us. Um, BTS uh, optimization is the word. BTS uh, versus new pop, uh, we, can, we can do a lot in, the, in this. Um, what do I think about the merger of operators? Uh, so we have to be clear on short-term effect and long-term effect. Uh, the first thing that is important to us is that our clients are in good shape. Uh, to be a bit cynical, I want them to pay us, so they have to be in good shape. To be even more cynical, I want them to invest more, and so they have to be in good shape. In some markets, uh, the overcompetition is preventing uh, uh, a good, uh, a good uh, level of investment. A good level of investment means densification of the network. Densification of the network means more sites, more small cells, more dust, more everything. So short term, every time uh, there is a merge between uh, or a potential merge between two MNOs, uh, the, what we have to be uh, careful is not to have uh, uh, not to be penalized uh, on what we paid in the past uh, in order to be there. Uh, so it has to be a fair negotiation. We can accept uh, uh, marginal deviation, but we cannot accept uh, uh, monster deviation from uh, uh, what we agreed uh, and what we paid in the past. Uh, but these can be agreed in, uh, in the context uh, of, of a merge. And uh, I think that uh, from more solid customers and more solid MNOs, uh, more investment, uh, it's good for us. Yeah. Our next question comes from Georgios Pierodiakono from City. Let's go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my questions. A uh, couple of follow-ups, please. The first one, um, Marco, you discussed uh, value crystallization and the fact that you would like to have some partners for a certain period of time during the investment phase. Um, I was just curious if you can also perhaps elaborate a bit more as to how you are thinking about the mix because clearly in some of the more mature markets, with multiple anchor tenants, you can have a better crystallization of value, but maybe in some other markets you may require more investments to gain scale and maybe acquire assets locally. So curious between the mix of the two, uh, what would be your preference? Um, the second is just a clarification on the comments you just made about the SFR agreement. Um, I was wondering if you can disclose perhaps how many of the sites are new and therefore built to suit versus collocations, if you have an idea, perhaps of the number of sites and also the mix uh, between the two, uh, that would be great. And then the final question is around the development we had recently uh, in Italy with uh, the spin-off of the network of one of the players, uh, who's your main anchor tenant, and an infrastructure fund looking to acquire it. 
Is this the type of business that in the future you could consider to be a bit more active if the balance sheet allows you, uh, conscious of the fact that in Poland you haven't gone fully that way, but you are already on the active side? Um, so if you see this trend of telcos uh, perhaps going a bit further in what they're willing to give up, if Celnex will be there uh, in these adjacencies or whether that is a step too far for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you Georgios. Uh, value crystallization. Uh, I think that uh, every hypothesis has the perfect partner. There is not a perfect partner for everything because as you, as you perfectly underlined, uh, there are different uh, market conditions, uh, so different needs and so different partners. Uh, uh, you were referring to solid, uh, mature markets. Uh, what is uh, the preferred partner in this case uh, is a partner with low cost of capital and with good interest of dividends and potentially a longer horizon. There are markets uh, in which uh, something will happen in the future. Uh, there has been speculation on the on the Nordic country. Well, the Nordic country is a is a place where something will happen in the in the coming years because uh, Telia, Telenor, everybody is changing their approach to the market. So you need someone who is uh, with a with a more entrepreneurial attitude. If there is more capital to put on the table, uh, you need to have someone who can make a follow on, if the case. So there is not. Uh, there is not the single perfect partner. Every partner is good or bad, depending on where you want to put, uh, uh, put, to, to put the partner. Are we looking more to situation uh, where uh, the market is very stable or situation where the market uh, is moving? Uh, uh, I tell you that we are agnostic. Uh, there are situations where the market, where the value has not really became very explicit because it's still a work in progress. So where it is still a work in progress, I think that uh, we should leave on the table too much value in crystallizing uh, uh, the asset the asset evaluation uh, in the hand of a partner. A partner will say, okay, I want to be part of these, uh, of this work in progress. And uh, I think that uh, we have all the expertise and let me be a little bit proud of ourselves. Uh, uh, also, we have the money and we are not, I'm not sure that we, do, we need someone to make our job. So we are more than able to make our job. Uh, but there are situations uh, where uh, having a partner can be very helpful or uh, the market is mature enough that we can, uh, we can open to someone. Um, I take uh, uh, the third because I leave uh, I leave uh, the second uh, to uh, Juan who has uh, the the number so he's uh, the the bean counter of the story so I leave I leave him uh, to to count the beans so network separation what I think what I what uh, we are again in the in the in the story of the adhesion of the adhesion investment uh, so I give you two answers first are we okay or are we against uh, uh, natural separation uh, in Italy, uh, we are neutral. Um, at the end, uh, uh, the quality of, uh, of the counterparty uh, having uh, a netco or having an integrated player uh, in this specific circumstance uh, doesn't change at all. Uh, so uh, we are fine uh, and uh, uh, it will not, a uh, uh, problem will not come for us. Uh, then, is it a territory where we can play? Uh, there should be value creation. So in outsourcing a network, uh, I think that uh, the value creation from the pure outsourcing of a network uh, is relative. Yes, we can do it. Yes, we can have a, a, good, uh, a good return on the invested capital because we ask something uh, that uh, could be, let me say, rub oriented. Uh, I go and I ask uh, a minimum return on my invested capital, and this can be can be a business model. But the real, the real bingo uh, comes if you can consolidate networks. In the network consolidation, there is uh, a lot of synergy. 
uh, there is a, a good service that you can uh, provide uh, to the operators uh, that are consolidated in the network because their network will cost less. There will be a lower cost per giga. Uh, and uh, uh, running a network and selling to two MNOs uh, can, uh, can deliver extra boost in value. Is this a financial project? No, that's an industrial project. Consolidating networks uh, is uh, uh, from the engineeristic perspective. It's uh, it's not uh, walking in the grass uh, in a moonlight. Uh, it's tough. It's uh, it's complicated. You need a lot of uh, a lot of stars to be aligned. Well, if the stars align, uh, uh, of course we will uh, we will be a, a good uh, a good astronomic. So uh, please. The second question, George. Uh, basically, we are talking about an investment of uh, 275 million in exchange for around 1,800 uh, new POPs, all of them at an quarter and fees. Then the split which is around uh, all of these POPs uh, should be, be should be generated from 1,000 around 1,000 new sites, and the rest is coming from an, an acceleration of the intensification of the of the client. Okay, all, in all, all in all, if you make some math, you see that uh, it's a great deal. Uh, so uh, I, I, I congratulate our guys of the commercial brands. Excellent. This question comes from Andre Kupisek at UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation and taking my question. I've got a couple as well, please. So just uh, following up on the conversation between, uh, you know, scale uh, and presence that you were mentioning in terms of, you know, importance of having a pan-European footprint, what is the kind of balance that you would assess in, in markets where, you know, you are present today, such as the Nordics that have been mentioned, but also, for example, Austria, where, where clearly there is very little, you know, opportunity to consolidate and thus achieve scale because, uh, you know, 100% of your competition is industrial uh, and, and so forth. So what, what is kind of the, the, the approach here? Is it, is it uh, being in, in a place just for the sake of being there? Or would, uh, in a situation like this, the, the ability to scale up uh, or rather the inability in this case to scale up uh, prevail. Um, then in terms of, uh, you know, you, you, you talking about uh, the uh, optimization of leases going forward with, you know, rates continuing to creep up, uh, I was just wondering if the ambition in this scenario uh, would uh, be to just kind of uh, achieve the kind of guidance that you've given uh, previously uh, around $850 million for, for uh, 2023 and then uh, taking this number down to, say, 800 uh, or 30 roughly by 2025, or do you think that there is actually scope to do even more despite, you know, the, the interest rate curve probably creeping up uh, a bit further? Uh, and a third one, if I may, um, in terms of operating leverage, so, so you've highlighted that, uh, obviously, even last quarter you said this was an exemption, uh, and 2Q should see, or throughout the year you should see uh, operating leverage come through, so we are seeing this come through. But if you could explain to us the building blocks of, of, that, uh, of that turnaround in terms of operating leverage and how uh, you see this uh, you know, going forward, please. Thank you very much. Okay. So you made two great examples in pan-European uh, in pan-European partnerships uh, because you took two markets that represent really the extremes uh, of uh, the potential thoughts. Nordics is a place uh, where uh, everybody, everybody, uh, every expert uh, of the sector tells you that uh, something will happen, but uh, we don't know exactly in which order and when. Uh, therefore, uh, you need a, a, a partner, as I told you before, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, with deep pocket, uh, with good lateral thinking, uh, expert of the sector. So you need someone uh, who really wants to play the game uh, together with us. Uh, uh, don't, let, don't get me wrong, we are on the driving seat. But uh, uh, it's important to have a sparring partner uh, to to think uh, uh, in order to think together. Austria is exactly the opposite. It's, it's a blocked situation. Uh, so uh, Austria, uh, there are some big blocks. Uh, some of them 
moved a few time ago. Some of them are not expected to move. So how to how to get scale there? Uh, well, you get scale there uh, if uh, you you find a way to unblock uh, these uh, these uh, uh, this scenario. Uh, otherwise, uh, the risk is that you remain uh, subscaled and remaining subscaled, uh, you cannot get synergies. Uh, you know better than me that synergies are in-country synergies. The cross-country synergies are very modest, so you needed to have in-country synergies. So you made two very good examples because uh, the two examples drive you to what I was telling you before. There is not a, a, a one fits all. Uh, every country you have to see it, analyze, uh, and you have to make a strategic thinking before uh, taking uh, the checkbook uh, and understanding uh, who has uh, the, the, the right pen to sign the check. Uh, your second question was about leases. Uh, so uh, can we do more? Uh, this is exactly what we are working on in this moment, and this will be uh, one of the driver of our plan uh, in uh, that we are going to present uh, later on this year. Uh, my gut feeling uh, is uh, uh, probably yes. Uh, if uh, we're able to activate uh, the proper levers that uh, requires uh, deep work, uh, we have created a, a working an internal working group that is uh, with uh, that is a multi-country working group that is working on this. Uh, we have a best practice uh, in Italy, and we have uh, some several countries that can do significantly better, but we need to uh, to improve uh, our our performance. Um, the the last I ask you pardon we it was uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, bad the the reception I think you were talking about operating leverage yeah maybe maybe just one clarification on the second one just to just to clarify uh, numbers Andre so our 2023 guidance. Uh, includes 850 million of uh, leases, and then our 2025 guidance close to 900 million. Yes, yes to just to clarify the figures uh, uh, on, on our end. And maybe Andre, maybe maybe we'll, we will need to ask you again about your third question because we're not sure we got it. Apologies for that. Uh, sure, apologies. Uh, so, so, in terms of the operating leverage, I was just curious if you could remind us, because obviously you had a you had a situation in one queue where there was, uh, you know, negative operating leverage on, on on the level of EBITDA, but you flagged that this would kind of change in the coming quarters. If you could uh, explain to us, please, how exactly uh, you know that that played out, and and what do you expect for the for the rest of the yeah. year, perhaps? Thank you. Uh, absolutely, and, and and thank you. It is true. It is true that uh, in in Q in Q1 maybe uh, operating leverage was not so evident because you could see uh, that uh, um, our revenues grew faster than our EBITDA. That situation, if you look, back, if you focus on on Q2 only figures, that situation has reversed. So in this in this occasion, EBITDA has grown faster than revenues, and we believe that uh, that is the sort of a performance that you should be expecting in the coming quarters. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next question comes from Luigi Minerva from HSBC. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, I was wondering uh, if we, we can do a step back, uh, Marco, and uh, perhaps you can tell us you know, how uh, you uh, approached your first uh, 100 days as a CEO of Celnex. You know, how are you organizing your time, your priorities? And perhaps you can uh, mention, you know, three strengths and three weaknesses that so far you have seen uh, in the company. Uh, and then um, uh, perhaps a couple of uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, practical questions. No, the, the, the second one is about your, uh, um, you know, as you approach portfolio management and potentially consider disposals, uh, I'm wondering whether there is a sort of, you know, valuation uh, set of rules that you that uh, the team has in mind um, for example that uh, uh, you wouldn't sell assets uh, below sell next current trading multiples uh, and thirdly uh, in the past to get to investment grade uh, I, I, I wanted to ask if spreading the uh, build to suit uh, investment program over a longer period of time uh, is also an option that you are considering thank you 
So the first 10, 100 days uh, had been uh, a sort of a, uh, of a uh, incredible European rush. Uh, the first thing I did, I visited all the single countries. Uh, I spoke with, uh, I had a, a dedicated due diligence. Uh, uh, Alex was doing with me, the head of human resources was with, was with me. Most of the time, the CFO was with me. We spent, uh, we had one day meeting uh, with uh, all of them, uh, analyzing market by market. And in every single country, we met our uh, most important clients. With some of them, uh, uh, we had uh, to reassure that uh, the strategy was not uh, uh, getting investment grade, uh, just uh, uh, not performing uh, the agreement we had with them. So uh, it was operations first, uh, customer hand in hand with operations. Uh, and then we made uh, a, a very strong due diligence on numbers. Uh, so the, the, all, the, all the numbers uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, are in this, uh, in this group uh, have been uh, uh, revised. Uh, it has been, uh, believe me, a tough 100 days, not only for me, but also my colleagues had to, had to uh, how can I say, to, to leave with me. And so it was, it was a, tough, it, a, a tough couple of months. Uh, just to, to remember, my 100 days lasted 60 days. So it, uh, it's, it's a bit unfair <laughs> because my, my 100 days <laughs> ends mid of September, just for, for the love of arithmetics. So what, where we are very good, uh, every single client I've been talking with uh, uh, told us that, uh, that we are a good partner. This for me was uh, you know, a breath of fresh air. And, uh, and this, uh, this is extremely important. They were scared that we could be less engaged uh, because of CapEx constraint. And when we told them uh, uh, we will find a way to, uh, to do both uh, CapEx uh, and the leverage, uh, they were uh, relieved. Um, technically speaking, I found uh, that all our guys uh, uh, at the operation level uh, are particularly good, uh, so very well. The third strength, uh, I would say that there is a, a spread uh, knowledge uh, of uh, the financial metrics. Uh, so every every time you speak with someone, is well aware of uh, uh, the value driver and the financial value driver. So there is a spread knowledge. Uh, three weakness. Uh, one is uh, uh, we have uh, 12 countries and 13 operating models. Uh, so we have uh, we can have uh, uh, more synergies uh, if uh, we uh, standardize uh, some of the things we do. Uh, there are always good reasons for being different, uh, but sometimes there are even better reasons for being the same. And uh, this is uh, this is one uh, element we can do better. Second, uh, uh, our IT can improved can be improved. Uh, this requires a little bit of uh, IT capex. No worries, the payback will be super super duper short. Um, and uh, and uh, well, I am not in mind the third, so I stay I stay with two. <laughs> Uh, disposals. Uh, what are the rules of the, the house in, in my head? Uh, we have premium asset. We want premium evaluation. Uh, you were mentioning not below the, the trading multiple of Selnex. So you're very, very, very pessimistic. I would say not below uh, the best of the market. Uh, so I'm, I'm not... Uh, we are not talking about uh, something that you can easily find in the market. Uh, we have backlogs that are billionaire. We have relations with the customer that are multi-country, and this is a strength. We have operations in place. There is a scarcity factor. There are not so many good assets uh, on sale. There is a size. All the countries, we are sizable apart, with exception of a couple of, uh, of, of countries. So we have premium assets. We don't sit at the table if there is not someone who wants to give us premium valuation. Uh, BTS, make it longer. Uh, I think uh, exactly the opposite. I want my customer to have a strong 5G. But 
this is not uh, uh, on, uh, uh, there is zero doubt that uh, we will have to stay on the plan. So uh, what we are doing, we created a, a, a capital allocation, uh, uh, quite severe capital allocation uh, uh, procedure, uh, including at the board level, we created a capital allocation committee uh, in order to be 100% sure that we will allocate uh, our resources uh, with a priority list uh, that uh, uh, not only makes sense, but uh, turns into value uh, constantly. Um, so I, I, it's, not, it's not making the story longer that, uh, that you get the result, it's putting the money with a, with a clear priority. And I'm sure that uh, that uh, if there is not a clear priority, everybody understands that it can be delayed. Hope I answered. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Luigi. Next question comes from Jacob Luston from Exxon. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I'll, I'll keep it to one. Um, you talked earlier about how you wanted to find new low capital intensive revenue sources and I was hoping you could maybe expand a little bit on what do you mean by that? Um, what are some of these sort of additional revenue streams? And I guess, I mean, Selnex has probably been pursuing some of this already, so perhaps through the sort of augmented tower co. Um, so maybe if you can sort of particularly zoom in on what is it that you're going to do differently on the revenue side, uh, that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I was mostly referring uh, to uh, intelligent uh, co-location. Uh, once again, uh, the project uh, we have uh, signed uh, in uh, France uh, is uh, the type of project that we have to sit and discuss with our clients. Uh, sometime, uh, and uh, the, the question that Luigi made a second ago can be very, very useful. My client uh, believes that uh, building a new tower is faster for them uh, to deploy the 5G network. Uh, it's faster than uh, than co-locate on an existing tower. We are going to demonstrate that this is not true, that uh, uh, with uh, limited capex, which are the capex uh, necessary to uh, to reinforce uh, an existing tower, we can easily co-locate their 5G uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we will save uh, and we will save uh, uh, a lot of money. In the case uh, of uh, France, we save uh, more or less 800 BTS going on new pop. So even if uh, I have to reinforce the tower or what we call work and studies, uh, you can easily imagine that uh, the cost of the work and study is well below the the capex required for a new for a new BTS. There are other businesses that are relatively low capex because they use existing infrastructures. Um, I make you a very concrete example. Uh, we are winning uh, Tetra uh, agreements. The Tetra agreement uh, goes on existing tower. So you just have to make some capex and then you have a beautiful new tenant uh, that, by the way, you never expected because it's not an MNO, uh, who pays, of course, a little bit less than an MNO, uh, but at the end is very good. In some countries, you have IoT, FWA, uh, you, have, uh, you have a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of things that you can do. We are exploring uh, uh, we are exploring uh, opportunities with new entrant. Uh, example, Portugal. Portugal is uh, is building uh, something like 3,000 new pops on existing sites. I can talk uh, with you about uh, how we can explore broadcasting towers uh, in order to deliver new services to the cloud. So the list can be as long as you wish. Uh, each program, each project uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is something uh, different, something new. But what is important is that uh, the more you ask to the countries uh, to include these uh, into their uh, span of attention, 
uh, the more you see that there is a multiplicative effect uh, that uh, is going to work. So, and uh, and uh, another thing we are creating at at a corporate level, uh, we are creating a, a sales excellence team that is going to transfer know-how from one country to another. Because, for example, Spain is super strong in Tetra, and uh, we can use this experience in other countries. Uh, by the way, uh, at the corporate level, we are decreasing the headcounts. Uh, can, did, did you say ever the number? Yeah, 55, 60. So in order, in order of magnitude of 20 to 25 percent. Yes. So we do much more with the significantly less people. Uh, if, if Jacob, uh, yes, please. Thanks. No, so I was just going to ask a follow-up just on, on, as you described it, the sort of increasing smart tenancies. So I guess, I mean, essentially there's a bigger focus on growing the number of tenants per, per site. Are there any particular markets w which you would highlight where there's a particular opportunity for that um, that, that you've identified? All in every market. All mm -hmm. in every market. Because uh, because uh, uh, what, what we need is uh, to... To put uh, in the in the brain of our commercial guys that the, there is a, there is the possibility of doing more. There is, um, you know, we we risk uh, the the risk of that uh, I see is that we make the same uh, mistake uh, we were doing at the beginning of this uh, of this century when we were talking about internet. So everything was internet, and then we thought that uh, every, that nothing was internet. Uh, the truth is that we were just missing the timeline. Uh, make an example. At a certain point, uh, we thought that uh, we would develop uh, a gazillion uh, small cells, uh, DAS, uh, whatsoever. Now you take the business plan of everyone. There are no there are no small cells, so they disappeared. So we are putting just uh, wrongly on the timeline. I think that uh, if you take the capex intensity of a of a huge small cell program, you will be surprised that, that the capex per node is relatively efficient. So uh, we have to think differently. It's uh, it's a matter of thinking differently. Sorry, I'm making very long. So please pardon me. Thank you Thank so you. much. That's very helpful. Thank you, Jacob. Next question comes from Fernando Cordero from Santander. Please go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon and thanks for taking uh, my two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is uh, at some extent a follow-up on the previous one and at which extent the, uh, one of the organic growth levels that is, uh, present, has been present in the story, particularly in assets and assets, will continue to be there. Now, in that sense, uh, uh, I don't know which extent you see investment in assets and assets and your, and your name, small cells, but also talking about fiber to antenna or average computing are uh, uh, are fitting in these uh, smart uh, smart um, growth on low invested capital. No? And in that sense, um, I would like to understand if your comments on this kind of organic growth should derive on a uh, change on your views on the uh, on the targeted uh, organic expansion capex, which is currently at 10% over sales, and at which extent do you see some kind of change on this uh, on this guidance? And the second question is on capital allocation, and particularly uh, on the basis that uh, you were having uh, already the, the investment grade, whatever it takes. But uh, how are uh, what is your approach, sorry, in terms of uh, shareholder remuneration and what? Uh, on what extent the shareholder remuneration to represent uh, part of the capital generation, as I said, whenever you get the, the investment rate. Many thanks. It's, uh, it's starts to be a little bit difficult to continue to elaborate uh, on uh, on organic growth, uh, uh, but uh, let me let me tell you, uh, we have to. We have not to forget uh, that uh, we are partners uh, of uh, mobile networks, and uh, and I use the plural because it can be 4G, 5G, but it can be a security network. It can be FWA. It can be it can be a lot of things. It can be uh, microwave backhauling. It can be it can be literally a lot of things. 
uh, in some uh, in some circumstances, Spain and France, for example, we are working on fiber, uh, which is not only fiber to the antenna. We are buying also uh, metropolitan metropolitan area networks. So uh, I think that uh, it's important uh, to uh, to consider the the driver of the industry we are part of. Point number one. New services are going to, to be deployed on higher frequencies. Higher frequencies need uh, mean smaller cells. Smaller cells means uh, to have uh, more dense uh, uh, passive infrastructure. Point number two, electromagnetic limit. We hope that it can be released but permitting uh, it still in urban areas is still a nightmare this means uh, that uh, neutral networks uh, are going to be deployed uh, and looking and forward looking is going to be deployed third uh, forget about the fiber to the client uh, but the fiber to industrial premises is a growing business uh, there is a growing demand uh, of uh, wall cell fiber. And what we are building is a relation with our clients where we have significant spare capacity that we can sell uh, wall cell. So what I want to tell you, Fernando, is uh, uh, there is a organic core and there is organic adhesion and there is BTS. We are, we are not saying that we are not going to make the BTS. We have contracts. We have contracts that we have to build another sort of 20,000 BTS, and we will do. We will respect all our uh, contracts with all our clients. We will do it. But we have not to limit our growth to CAPEX-driven growth. We have to add also more. Is it something that we can do tomorrow morning because I arrived the day before yesterday? No. It means that we have to push in this direction. It will take a little bit of time. It means that we have to organize in a slightly different way. We will do it. Uh, the, uh, considering if you're a believer, Bible says that uh, the planet has been made in six days, so I don't pretend to make everything in one day. Um, capital allocation and shareholder remuneration. As I told you, I will not going to change uh, the plans vis-a-vis uh, -vis the clients. Then words are words, facts are facts. Until the day before yesterday, I was in Inuit, and so what we did, uh, when we reached uh, the target, uh, the target uh, uh, leverage, we said we go back and we remuner better remuner remunerate our shareholders. Words are words, facts are facts. So I think that uh, uh, I don't want you to believe my words. I want you to look at my facts. Very no and thanks for the for the color, Marco. Just a follow up. Um, what are your views regarding the broadcasting business in Spain? Sorry, Fernando, the line is not fantastic. Can you please repeat? Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, I, I was uh, I was sorry asking for uh, for Marcos uh, view on uh, the broadcasting business in Spain and at which extent you may think. Uh, what are your plans on on that business? I know that there are some tax efficiencies uh, coming from that uh, from that uh, mm -hmm. segment, but also we know which are the the, the long term outlook. Yes, I'm a, I'm a, a, a cruiser of the poor broadcasting uh, because I'm a, I'm the defender of uh, of the faith uh, of uh, of the broadcaster. The poor broadcaster is uh, is treated too badly. Uh, if you make the return on the invested capital of broadcasting, you will jump on the chair uh, because uh, the the capital allocated has been amortized uh, since uh, uh, ages, and uh, we are making very good returns. I think that we are looking uh, to the broadcasting uh, using the wrong parameter. If you ask to the broadcasting growth, uh, of course you are not going to have growth. If you ask to have a uh, ninety percent EBITDA. 
uh, you don't know the business, uh, so because it means uh, that uh, uh, this uh, requires more FTE, requires more more attention. These SLAs are very strict, uh, the infrastructure. But if you look at the right metrics, uh, which is the return on the invested capital in this business, uh, you will love it uh, the same way I love it. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, cash generator. Uh, it push up uh, uh, our uh, ROIC performance in Spain, and uh, and I'm proud of the guys uh, who have a level of expertise incredible. By the way, their level of expertise is allowing us to create, uh, and we are starting now to create a pan-European NOC, pan-European SOC, so we can use their experience uh, in order to use. Uh, uh, their spare time in order to offer services to other countries uh, where you have to have a network control. So uh, I wish I had one dollar every time that someone told me that broadcasting was dead because I would have been millionaire and I would not uh, be, be here with Jose Manuel. Uh, but uh, the truth is that uh, the broadcasting is doing well. Uh, the Spanish government just uh, said uh, that uh, they are going to launch ultra definition uh, uh, 4K on uh, on their multiplex, uh, which is super good news because it it extends uh, the the life uh, of uh, of this service. So uh, happy to have it. Very clear. Many thanks for the for the answer. Thank you, Fernando. Next question comes from Roshan Ranjit from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, just a quick follow-up on the uh, extension to the uh, SFR deal uh, in France, please. Um, I think uh, just based on the headline numbers, it adds around 50 million euros of CapEx uh, a year uh, as part of the bill to suit. Uh, Marco, you've been very clear around the scope for kind of CapEx efficiencies. Uh, I think you were outlining new efficiency plans at the CMD. Uh, is this a precursor to combining the builder suits uh, in, in France? Um, I think you know, the previous guidance was around 1.6 billion of builder suit CapEx in 23. So you know, can we see uh, upside risk to that number uh, as a result of these efficiencies? Uh, and just a quick follow-up on uh, organic growth, which you've gone into great detail, 7% uh, growth for the pop growth for H1. Uh, I know your guidance is greater than 5, but given the way densification is going, uh, is there a kind of material upside to that number, do you see? Thank you. I don't know if I have followed well the first question. Your first question was about acquisition, Build to suit, you have said, 50 million euros. I think you are talking about potentially acquisition of lands that we have carried out. Yes, Roshan, is it? Yes, yeah, just in case. If you could please uh, uh, repeat, just to make sure that we understand okay. your question, Roshan. Sorry, please. Oh, sure. Uh, sorry. Uh, it was with the uh, SFR deal, uh, the secure That's investment out. at 275 million. Um, yeah, uh, and how that built us into your existing build to suit program. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is that is essentially that is essentially on top. So that is not uh, was essentially contemplated. Also, bear in mind that uh, that is not going to impact any any guidance uh, because of the nature of the process. It is uh, stuck on time. Uh, also, you shouldn't be expecting uh, an immediate deployment of this uh, of this project. Our expectation is that uh, maybe the benefit uh, is going to be more visible from 2026 onwards. You know that at the run rate for this project is 2029. So I think that uh, that is something we can accommodate within our uh, within our objectives, and uh, when we are mentioning the, our intention to become free cash flow neutral by the end of 23 uh, and 24, that is not that is not going to be changed because of this project. Yes, we can easily accommodate uh, the 23 and 24 portion. We can easily accommodate in uh, in a uh, capex optimization that we are designing internally. So no no worries on this. I don't know if there was a second part uh, in your question, uh, Roshan. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. It was just uh, on the organic growth. You delivered 7% pop growth in H1, and in your previous guidance, you've said greater than 5%. And the way you've been talking around really driving the tenancy and the lease up 
and densification from uh, requirements from the MNOs. Is there upside to this number now? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, if you if you look, we gave uh, also the the deployment of the seven percent by country, and you see that uh, there is a, a very important contribution coming from Portugal, which is uh, the acceleration that DG is asking us uh, in order to deploy their network, uh, uh, envisaging uh, the launch of the service. Uh, you know that the DG project uh, is. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a strong project uh, that is giving us an extra boost. Uh, so I would say that part of this uh, uh, exceptional uh, DG is, uh, is, uh, is pushing uh, the 7%. Never forget, <laughs> as uh, per chart number six, uh, that the seven percent is a sort of a three point three percent is coming from BTS and a sort of four percent is coming from new locations. So the BTS is following a program. Uh, 2023 is a is a heavy is a heavy number is a heavy uh, capex uh, capex uh, uh, year, um, which uh, uh, means a lot because uh, if we are able and I believe that we will be able to be uh, free cash flow neutral. So forget about recurring. Let's use free cash flow. We are free. If we are free cash flow neutral this year with the amount of capex we are going to do this year, uh, 2024, which is lighter in terms of capex, uh, uh, you see that uh, the the trajectory of, uh, of the 24 is uh, for a, a natural improvement in free cash flow. But to go to your question, so the 7% is given today by a 3% BTS and a 4% new collocation. The 4% of new collocation has a push from DG Portugal. Uh, are they going to push uh, all the time? Uh, until when they push, we're happy. Uh, the day they will uh, stop pushing, we will ask to some other country to do more. Uh, I think that the 7% has been something uh, uh, outstanding. So we are not going to change our our um, our target uh, because uh, of the 7%. That's very clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roshan. So yes. now two old friends. Yes, as we are uh, going... Past, past the hour, so the last question of questions will come from Javier Papam at uh, Medio Banca. Please go ahead. Sorry, yeah, to be clear, Hi. I cannot, uh, I cannot not answer to Nick. So I, I will take Nick, uh, Nick Delfos because otherwise he kills me. Okay. Since we know each other, since uh, I will never say how many years because it means that he is old. Fantastic. We have created more time. Please go ahead. <laughs> Fabio, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hi, Marco, welcome. Um, Ciao, Fabio. So we had uh, discussed about almost everything, just trying to join in some dots. Uh, it seems you have in mind uh, uh, some, some new business opportunities, some disposal. So one question could be, uh, what is the corridor for the leverage you would consider it fair? For Selnex, and the other question is a new business opportunities again in the future. Um, the 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 big deal refers to edge computing. So, uh, do you think uh, uh, artificial intelligence could be much more source of new revenues? I'm thinking about cloud and edge, or it will have much more to do about uh, uh, options for efficiency and cost saving. Thank you. Um. I start from the from the from the first, uh, which is the corridor for the leverage. We said we are going to go below seven times. Uh, maybe we can uh, we can uh, find uh, our sweet spot uh, a bit uh, a little bit lower than just below seven times. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that our industry and most importantly. Our backlog, I never saw in my career 
such an impressive backlog uh, as uh, uh, this company has. Sometimes I think we tend to underestimate the power of this backlog because if by chance uh, we stop investing, uh, we make so much cash that we will ask ourselves what to do with the cash. So uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, I don't see uh, us going below six times, uh, uh, but uh, uh, let me say that uh, uh, if we just say below seven times, probably uh, we can do a, a little bit, uh, a little bit more than below seven times. Um, this, your second question: I think that short term, uh, the network virtualization uh, is more an efficiency lever than uh, a new, a new, uh, a new source of uh, of revenues uh, because uh, if you consider that this year we have uh, more than 4 billion uh, revenues uh, in our forecast. Okay, let's uh, let's make uh, the revenues without the pass-through. It remains uh, well above uh, 3 point, uh, so let's say 3.5. And, uh, and uh, so the contribution of artificial intelligence to my revenues uh, is going to be nanometric. Uh, not the same uh, on uh, on the possibility of having uh, interesting uh, effects uh, on the network topology, on the capex uh, and on the costs. Uh, just to make you clear, uh, if we go to a virtual run configuration or to a cloud run configuration, uh, antenna will become much lighter and probably smaller which means that uh, you can host uh, more antenna on the same tower and you can remotely control if you control the uh, the former MSC that uh, to, tomorrow will be point of aggregation of virtual RAM. Uh, so I think that our configuration in France is super interesting because we are buying uh, these uh, point of, of configuration and point of aggregation. Uh, that can give us a very interesting, uh, a very interesting possibility in this sense. So, Fabio, I think it's more from from efficiency or network design. We no longer see Nick connected, so we will finish so, with Nick Delfos if you're there. Otherwise, we end here. Okay. So you can you can witness that uh, that I uh, that I made. Uh, so if he complains, it's not my fault. Fantastic. Then thank you so thank you so much. For thank you. For your time. Thank you all. It has been a pleasure to be with you in this conference call. I hope to see you in person soon.